Hebrews chapter number 11, I, uh, whether you are or are not aware of this, is actually one of the most famous chapters in the entire Bible. It is at least by any standard or by any measurement top three of the most famous chapters in the Bible. If I were to say what the majority of you know, uh, scholars, if you will, or the majority of people that would say, you know, what are the top three uh, most famous chapters in the Bible, they would be John chapter number 1, 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, and Hebrews chapter number 11. This is extremely, an extremely famous and well-known chapter. Now, of course, the overall summary of the chapter is faith. It is on the subject of faith. And actually, chapter number 10 worked its way into this. I'm not going to review that because I actually mentioned that uh, last week and let you know that it tied in with the context of Hebrews chapter number 11. But Hebrews chapter number 11, as I said, is about faith. It's a longer chapter. I believe there's 40 verses exactly, 40 verses. And a lot of people have dubbed it as the Hall of Faith. You know, uh, making the play, of course, on the Hall of Fame. But in this case, it is the great faith of the elders or of those that came before us. The great faith of those of the past, of the Old Testament. One thing that you may or may not have noticed about Hebrews chapter number 11 is that it actually goes through uh, each of the, the, the men that had great faith in the Old Testament scriptures in chronological order. The whole chapter is actually in chronological order and it just speaks of faith and how they had great faith, the importance of faith. Now we're just going to begin in verse number 1, Hebrews chapter number 11. Verse number 1, the Bible says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now we're going to read a few verses here and then I want to uh, explain, starting at verse number 1, what it's actually teaching. So right there in verse number 1, you know, first off it starts off with faith as we saw. Now faith, the very beginning of the chapter. Now look at verse number 2. For by it, referring to faith, the elders obtained a good Report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now Hebrews chapter number 11 verse number 1 starts off in the very beginning and makes the statement, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So it gives you that statement. What is faith? If we were to define faith, what is faith? And it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now what is the substance of something? The substance is what something is made up of. So it's asking what is faith if you were to define faith? Well it's the substance of what you're hoping for. If I was able to, able to peer into someone's heart and actually see their faith, what you're going to see is what they are hoping for, what they are you know, uh, uh, um, you know, looking forward to, or what they are trusting in, if you will, what they have faith in. So it's just defining for you in a very basic way of what faith actually is. What is it made up of? What is it? Right? That's the substance. What is it? It's what you're hoping for. That's the simplest what that, that first statement means. It's what you're actually hoping for. That's what faith means. Now the second part I believe is very misunderstood. It says this, the evidence of things not seen. Now I've heard this explained that faith is the evidence of things not seen. The fact that you have faith is that it, that is the evidence of the things that are not seen. And I don't agree that that's the correct interpretation. I don't believe that that is what this is teaching. I'll explain to you what I believe from this exact passage and defining scripture with scripture of what that means. One of the th reasons why I don't believe that is because you could, you could uh, 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 relate that to any false religion. If we kind of look at this logically, obviously, you know, Scripture takes precedence, and I'm going to show you from the Bible why I don't believe that. But even logically, that does not make sense. By that measure, or by that account, that would validate a Buddhist faith, or it would validate a Hindu's faith, because they have faith. They have a faith. It's a false faith. They're believing in something that's not real, but they have faith. And you could say, well, that's the evidence of what he's hoping for. Therefore, his faith is right, or he has the correct faith. So logically, it doesn't make sense. And the Bible's logical. You know, the, uh, you know God talks about come and let us reason together. The Bible's logical because it's truth. So that doesn't make sense. But what it actually means when it says the evidence of things not seen. I want to explain that by verse number three. Look at verse number three. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And then it says this, so that things which are seen, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do 
up here. In Hebrews chapter number 11, that last statement when it says the evidence of things not seen, it's talking about what your faith is in. Because I want you to remember that that very first statement was actually talking about the substance of it, right? So it's speaking about what is the substance or what is your faith actually in. And it's in what you are trusting in or what you have your faith in is the evidence of things not seen. So I believe that what this is teaching is that there is an ev evidence of the things that are not seen. There is an evidence of God. There is an evidence or a proof that the Bible is true. And if you were to say, what is the evidence? Well, verse number three, I believe, points you to one of the evidences that there is a creator. There is evidence of a creator. It tells you at the very end, again, to read that, it says, so that things which were, I'm sorry, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So I want you to notice that, th that statement, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. You know, the Bible tells you in Romans chapter number one that there is evidence of the Creator. Keep your hand here and go to Romans chapter number 1 real quick. We're not going to be turning too much tonight. We're going to be staying in the book of Hebrews uh, most of the night. I want you to look with me at verse number 20. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now doesn't that statement very, very uh, uh, categorically teach to you that there is an evidence of God. It says, for the invisible things of Him. So I want you to notice that there are invisible things of God. Right. Aren't there? There are invisible things of God. From the creation of the world are clearly seen. So you can look at the things around you, and then there are behind that, that proves that there is evidence of invisible things. Now, is something invisible something that you can see? Of course not. Now go back to chapter number 11, verse 1. The evidence of things not seen. That's the invisible thing. So there is evidence of the things that are not seen. There's evidence that there is a creator. It's not saying that the faith is the evidence. The evidence is refer referring back to the things that are hoped for. And what are you hoping for? You're hoping for, let's say, the creator. You're hoping for, you know, the Lord and believing in God, right? Then also tying that in with verse number 3, that same concept that we got from Romans 1 and applied it to the evidence of things not seen. Look at verse 3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Now watch this. So that the things which, were, which are seen were not made of things which do appear. So it's very obvious when you look around there are things that appear. That's things that you can see. But we understand that there must have been something that does not appear. That is the invisible things of him are clearly seen. So there is evidence of God. Be like, show me evidence that there's a, cre that there's a creator. The creation. There has to be a creator because there is a creation. The fact that we are all here proves that there's a God. Right. It's that simple. Right. I mean, that's before we delve into the molecular level and all the complexity of the, of the universe and the intricacies of every aspect of, of DNA and just so many different, you know, complex things about our universe. There are evidences of the creator. Not only that... There are evidences of God, and I believe it's the Bible. I believe Hebrews chapter number 11 is a great example of God, and that this is the Word of God, and that this is, you know, the true book. And we're going to get into that here, I believe, at the very end. Hebrews chapter number 11 is an extremely powerful chapter. So notice there that the evidence is actually referring to the things that prove that there, are a, there is a Creator. And then it says in verse number 3, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. So now I want to point out a different aspect of, of this verse. Go to Hebrews chapter number 1. Hebrews chapter number 1. So there notice that it said that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. It tells us in verse number 2 of Hebrews 1, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. So I want you to notice there how it says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 2 that the Son made the worlds. But then we get over here in Hebrews chapter number 11 verse 3 and it says that the Word of God made the worlds. Why is that? Because the Son is the Word of God in the flesh. The Son is God manifest in the flesh. I've also heard it stated, and I believe that this is misunderstood as well, at the very end of uh, verse number 3 it says, so, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. I've heard 
it explained by, you know, people even Ken Hove and I've heard use this, Ray Comfort, who obviously is not even saved, use this, but a lot of different like uh, uh, creation science evangelists will use this verse to say, see this is actually teaching that there are molecules in DNA and that things which you see are made up of things which do not appear, things that you cannot see. That's not what this is teaching. It's like I had already explained it correctly, it's actually teaching that the things that you see we're not made by things that you can see right now. They're made by things that do not appear to your eyes. What it's saying is that there's evidence that there's something that is not seen by just looking at things that do appear. That's what that is teaching. It's saying that everything that you look at now was not created by something that you're looking at or something that you can see. Like how if you look at a dog, you know, you see two dogs, right? And then they, of course, you know, uh, copulate and then they bring forth another dog. Well, in that sense, it would be like, well, those two dogs brought forth something that you can see. Well, it's saying everything that you look around at today and you, and you can see with your own eyes was not created originally, you know, in its origin by something in the universe itself. That it came from something transcendent that is outside of the universe. That's what verse number 3 is teaching. And I think that this is very simple and easy to understand. But I've never heard anyone, it's so strange, these simple passages exposit this correctly. But I think it's pretty profound. It's an, it's an amazing chapter that actually teaches that when it's talking about faith, it's teaching, hey, it's easy to have faith in this sense. It's easy because the, you know, when you look around, right before your eyes, what you're looking at is actually evidence that there's something that you cannot see, which is an amazing truth. Look at verse number four now. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. So right there it mentions Abel. Goes all, starts all the way back in the very beginning. Obviously, the only uh, two people that were before uh, uh, Cain and Abel was Adam and Eve. You know, I didn't mention Adam and Eve in this case, but it gave us a quick introduction with the first three verses there that we're going to be talking about faith. It defines faith for us. It's, it's, this is written so advanced. And it's, just, uh, it's laid out from beginning to end perfectly. It defines faith in verse number one. In verse number two, it, it basically gives you a summary that, hey, we're going to be talking about the faith of the elders. And when it says elders there, it's speaking of the people that came before us. Elders is a, a word that can be used in a few different ways. And uh, it means older, or it means uh, a man that is mature, or it, uh, you know these different types of ways. But this is actually proof to the fact that it is a loose word and a general word, because in this sense, it just means men of the past. Men that came before us. Men that are considered patriarchs. That's what it means, elders. And notice that it begins with Abel. This is the first elder that it's going to talk about. Now, of course, we know the story of Abel and Cain, how they brought their offerings. Uh, God accepted Abel's offering because he brought, of course, the lamb, which pictured the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Cain's offering was rejected because he brought... The fruit of his works, he brought the fruit of his own labor. Literally, he brought vegetables and things that, of, of produce that he had gathered up and you had to work hard for. And that symbolized, you know, work salvation. As opposed to, or contrasting to, uh, uh, Abel just trusting in the blood of the lamb. He just brought the lamb. That's all that he brought. Representing, you know, that God is doing the work and that he's trusting in the work of God. Now, of course, God would have had to have given them the, the, the correct instructions because the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Every person that we're about to read about is going to be trusting in the Word of God. Every time that we, that in any way that we put our faith in God, it has to be in His Word. Which makes perfect sense why verse number 3, right there in the introduction as well, would begin with the Word of God and how in the origin, God created the world by His Word. So it also tells us there that uh, at the very end of verse number 4, it says, God testifying of His gifts, and by it, He being dead, yet speaketh. So I, there's, there's, I believe, two layers to that verse right there. Number one, I believe that it's talking about the fact that He has eternal life. And that he was made righteous. But not only that, the fact that he can be a witness to us today through the scriptures. So I believe there's a, a couple of different meanings that we can take away from that. Another thing that I want to point out to you that, and these, this is very much introductory so far. 
I want, you to, I want to point out to you in verse number 4, I want you to notice that it says about Abel, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. So when it says by which, what is it talking about? His faith. So how, how is he made righteous? By what? By his faith. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. And of course it says God testifying of his gifts. So the witness is of God. God is the witness of his what? Of his faith. So going all the way back to Abel, what, what was it that, uh, uh, that Abel had or did to become righteous? His faith. All the way back to Abel. Now I want you to notice that while we walk through here. Verse number 5 it says, By faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. So notice how it keeps uh, uh, pointing out God's testimony, God's witness. So God is the only one that can truly see our faith. And if you want to please God, you must have faith. When he looks down, that is what pleases God. Of course, we remember the story of Enoch in the Old Testament. And Enoch, the Bible says, walked with God. And it says that he was not, is the way that it was worded in the Old Testament. We're given some more information about what that means. Because oftentimes in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when it says he was not, sometimes that means that he died. But right here it actually tells us that he did not die. It says he did not see death. And then it says, and was not found. So he didn't die, but he wasn't found either. And then it says this. It says... Uh, because God had translated him. So this is very similar to the rapture. It's a picture of the rapture. And it says, because God had translated him. And it says, for before his translation, he had this testimony. So what was it that caused God to take Enoch? What was it that, that caused God to translate Enoch and to bring him to heaven with him? What was it that pleased God so much where God said, I just want you to come to heaven and, to come to heaven and be with me? What was it? It was his great faith. So see how important faith is to God. Look at verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. So if you don't have any faith, it's not possible to please God. That's how you please God is with your faith. For, meaning because, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. So you must first believe that he is, that he exists and that he is real. And that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And also that God is going to reward you. Verse 7. Notice we're going in chronological order here. By faith Noah, being warned of God, now watch this, of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. Now notice that that is compatible with the definition of faith. It said, it said, by faith Noah, being warned of God, of things not seen as yet. And what is faith? It's the evidence of things not seen. And what did Noah do? He, of course, prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Because it's going to be citing Old Testament uh, uh, you know, uh, stories and things that took place. By the which he condemned the world, and watch this, became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. How was uh, Noah made righteous? Was it by his great life that he had lived? By the great works that he had? No, it was by his faith. He became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So, not only is that talking about him being, being the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. If you, if you read that grammatically, it's actually telling you that he became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. How do you get true righteousness or real righteousness? Telling you which is by faith. That's how you obtain righteousness because you're not going to live a perfect life. No man can do that. Verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which, which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. Now again, is this something that he saw? Remember, what is the definition of faith? The evidence of things not seen. So it's something that he did not see, see. And it says, not knowing whither he went. So he had never been there. He had never been to this land. God just told him about it. And what happened? Abraham believed him. Because he had faith in God's word. So he, he had faith in the Lord. 
He had never received it, and he went anyways. Look at verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country. Now, strange there just means foreign. It's not his country. It's not his native or homeland. So it says a strange country. Dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Now, a lot of people aren't familiar with the word tabernacle, and tabernacle just means tent. It's not a word that we use at all today, but it's specifically, it's, it, you, you must understand what that word means, especially in certain contexts, because right here it's emphasizing the fact that he was sojourning. It says, by faith he sojourned. And sojourn means to stay somewhere temporarily. And that's why it points out the tabernacle, because a tabernacle is something that someone uses in a case where that is not their permanent dwelling. It is not their native land. You would have a house in that, place, in that case. That's why it's pointing out the fact that he has a tabernacle because it's just showing that he's sojourning in this land and he had been promised this land. It wants to point out the fact that, that he, was, he was only there temporarily and he was using a tabernacle knowing that he was only there temporarily, but he still had faith that he was going to receive the promise. That's why that's important. Look at verse 10. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. What's very interesting about Hebrews chapter number 11 is that this whole entire chapter tells you about the great faith that many of the elders had in the past. And you can't read about these things when you just pick up the Old Testament. When you pick up the Old Testament and you read about this, it doesn't tell you exactly what's going on inside their minds and how they're viewing things and how they you know, uh, uh, viewed the promises of God. Look at verse number 10 and I want you to keep that in mind. It says this again about Abraham. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So it tells you what Abraham was looking for. Now in the Old Testament, did it ever mention that? Not one single time. Not one time. But it tells you that what Abraham was actually looking for was a city, was a city which hath foundations. And then it says, whose builder and maker is God. So he was looking for a heavenly city, wasn't he? That's what he was expecting to receive. That's what was going on in his mind and actually what he was, he was you know, hoping for. This is something that he had never seen, isn't it? This is the substance of his faith. This is what his faith actually was was what it is made up of. What are you hoping for? What are you looking for? Look at verse number 11. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seeds. So it's talking about the great faith that Sarah had and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So notice she was past age. She was past, the Bible talks about, about the time of women. You know, she was no longer having her menstrual cycle. She was scientifically and physically impossible. It was impossible for her to have a child. But of course, you know, he who created the womb, he who created the anatomy of the female, of course, was able to cause her to bring forth a child, even when she, it, was, it was scientifically impossible. Why? Because she had great faith, because she judged him faithful who had promised. She believed that he was faithful and that he would come through on his promise. Look at verse 12. <clears throat> Therefore sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead. That's talking about Abraham. <coughs> and the way you can, do, you can uh, know that is because if you... Uh, Cross-reference it with Romans chapter 4. There's a very similar statement about him being uh, as good as dead or uh, very similar to that. So many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Then it says this in verse 13, a great verse. <clears throat> These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embrace them and confess that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now the promises that it's talking about are the promises that come with the new covenant. That's what the, the whole book of Hebrews is about the promise of the new covenant, all the different promises that come with it, all the great benefits of the new covenant and how it's better than the old covenant. And right here when it's talking about how they didn't receive the promises, it's talking about that they weren't here during the time on earth when that covenant was fulfilled, when it actually was, was made 
active, when it was actually consummated and put into place where they saw the Messiah, they weren't here for that. They didn't receive the promises in that sense. They were just looking forward to the cross. This is actually the perfect verse that points that out. It says, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were pilgrims, I'm sorry, and were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That is a perfect description of Old Testament salvation. Perfect description. Notice that it says that they died in faith, not having received the promises, but then it says this, but having seen them afar off. So did they receive them? Were they given to them clearly? Did they understand them in every single detail? No. But did they know about them? Yes. It says that they, but having seen them afar off. What, is it, what does it mean it's far off? Can, is, it, does that mean that it's clear or that it's kind of vague? No, it's, it's vague. It's hard to make out. It's kind of like a, a good representation. It'd be like maybe if you were on a highway when you were driving on a highway. And, you know, there's a point when you're looking at the signs, you know, the highway signs, maybe the interstate signs, where you can barely make it out. You can just kind of see just, just slightly what it says. But the closer you get to it, the more clear that it becomes. And then you're able to read the details. You can see the exit number. You can see the city, maybe, the street. All different types of information you're able to make out. Well, even prior to that, you're still able to know that there is a, 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 an exit coming up, aren't you? You're able to look and see a highway sign, and let's say that it, it is an exit sign. And you can identify and say, that's an exit sign. I can tell that that's an exit sign. Then when you get closer, you're able to make out more of the details. Well, it's the same thing with the Old Testament saints. You know, people want to try to hyper-dispensational sort of try to point out, like, they didn't even know about the death, burial, and resurrection. They didn't even know about this. They didn't even know about that. How are they trusting in Christ to save them alone if they didn't even know that he was going to die and be buried and, and, you know, raise again? That's what the gospel is. Yeah, they knew the gospel. They knew the good news. They understood that there were good tidings. They could look at the exit sign, but they weren't able to know the details. They knew that there was a deliverer that was coming. They knew that there was a Messiah that was coming and that he was going to save them. But they didn't quite understand how. They knew that he was coming. And then it says this. They were persuaded of them. So it said they, that they saw them afar off, having seen them, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them. And then it says this. And embraced them. So they may not have understood that it was going to be through his death, burial, and resurrection. And yet his disciples might not have understood that, hey, he's got to first die, be buried, and then raise again. But do you know what they knew? He's going to save me some way or another. He's going to deliver me some way or another. They may not have understood the full spiritual aspect of it, but do you know what they did know? God is going to provide salvation for me. God is going to send a Messiah. God is going to save me. Amen. That's what they knew, and they trusted God, and they believed God. They didn't have to know all the details. They, all they did was they looked to the promises, and they trusted in them. And then it says, and, and it says that they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They knew that this was not their home. They knew that, that, they, that this is not where they wanted to be permanently. They wanted to be with God. That's where all of these people wanted to be. That's why it says they're looking for a, a, a city. It says, for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So remember the fact that they want to go and dwell with God. They want to go and live in the city of God. They want to go to heaven is what it's referring to. Amen. And then it says in 14, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Just talking about the regular land of Canaan there. Because now look at verse 16. But now they desire, watch this, a better country. What's one of the main themes of the book of Hebrews? How it's better. What's, you, want, you want to know one thing that's better in the new covenant? The country, the city. You want to know one, one thing that's much, much better when you compare the old covenant and the new covenant? The land of Canaan, Jerusalem. The, the true Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, is a better country than the Jerusalem that's on this earth, than the Jerusalem which now is. It says, but now they desire a better country. Watch this. That is an heavenly. 
Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. So we get more details there. Like I said, where did they want to go? They wanted to go and dwell and be with God. They wanted to live with God and spend eternity with God. They wanted to go and live in heaven with God. Notice what it says there. This is very interesting. I love that statement. It says, For he hath prepared for them a city. Go to Revelation chapter 21. Go to Revelation chapter number 21. This is, you know, some of those things in the Bible that there's no way that, you know, any man could uh, have such you know, details that tie in so perfectly. I want you to look at this. So what, what city is it talking about? It's talking about a heavenly city that God made, right? And it says that he hath prepared for them a city. Now who prepared it? It's saying God prepared it. For he hath prepared for them a city. Revelation chapter number 21. Look at verse number 1. This is the great details of heaven. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. Now watch this. Prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I want you to notice that it's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Who prepared it? God prepared it as a bride adorned for her husband. Notice what the city is. The city is the bride. Adorned for her husband. That's talking about the sons of God. It's talking about Jesus. And then it says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them. Notice that. Those are precious words. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. Notice that statement again. Notice the strong consistency. And be their God. It says in verse 16 again, Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Now who prepared for them a city? God. Who prepared the city for them over here in, verse, in chapter 21, verse number 3? God prepared the city. You know what Jesus said to his disciples before he left in John chapter number 14? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Amen. So you know who Jesus is? Jesus is God. You know who prepared the city? Jesus. Do you know who else prepared the city? God. Because Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is God. He prepared us a city. Also, look in Hebrews chapter number 11 while keeping your hand in Revelation 21. Remember what it said about Hebrews 11.10 about the city. It said, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Notice the builder and maker, the preparing. God did that. And what, it, what about the city does he tell you? It says that the city hath foundations. Now, does cities normally have foundations? No, normally they do not. Normally you would have a foundation, singular, in the first place. But notice that this city itself has a foundation, number one. And number two, it doesn't only have a single foundation. It has multiple. And that's what Abraham was looking for. Look at Revelation chapter number 21 again while describing the city. It says in verse 10, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city. The holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. Having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone clear as crystal. And it had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and, the, and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. Then it goes through all the gates there. I want you to look at verse 14. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. Notice that. What does this city have? It has foundations. And who was the builder and the maker of this city? God. Just like Abraham was looking for a city, it says, For he looked for a city whose builder, which hath foundations, I'm sorry, whose builder and maker is God. Notice the strong consistency between Revelation 21 and Hebrews chapter number 11. We're not going to look at this, but also this is almost identical to the, the statements that were made to Abraham from God. He talks about how he's going to have uh, an everlasting covenant with him. And he said, and I will be your God, or I will be their God, uh, referring to his seed. Keep reading there and re uh, back to Hebrews chapter number 11. We're going to look at verse number 17 now. Continuing about the great faith of Abraham, it says this, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, that means like tempted, offered up Isaac. And he, excuse me, that had received the promises, offered up his only begotten son. Of whom, talking about his only begotten son, 
it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. So, of course, God gave the promise to Abraham that from Isaac there would be a seed innumerable. They would be like the, the, the stars of heaven or like the, the sand that is upon the seashore. And God came to Abraham, tempting Abraham and trying him and told him to take up his only begotten son, this is Isaac, of course, and to offer him as a burnt sacrifice upon the altar. And because Abraham had such great faith, he still believed God and he did so. He took Isaac up there and was truly and really going to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. But look at what it says in verse number 19. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. So why did he do it? Why did he go through with that even though he knew that the promise said from God that he was going to be the, the father of many nations and that it was going to come through Isaac. Why did he do it anyways? Because he believed God so much. He had such strong faith in God that he said that what's going to happen is I'm going to take Isaac up to the mountain and I'm going to sacrifice him as God has, has commanded me to. And what's going to happen is God's going to have to raise him from the dead. Because he knew whatever happens, Isaac has to come down off that mountain. Isaac has to have children as well. Isaac has to be the progenitor for me to fulfill this promise. And he knew that God was faithful and he knew that God wasn't going to go back on his promise. I want you to notice that he knew no matter what that God has already promised me and that promise is going to come true. So the only way out is, well, God said to kill him. Therefore, when I kill him, God's going to raise him from the dead. And then it says this. From whence, saying in the, the, the death and burial of, uh, and resurrection of Isaac... From whence also he received him in a figure. Now notice it says, from whence also he received him in a figure. Who did he receive? Of course, he received the Lord Jesus Christ in a figure. That was him. He didn't, so you say, well, Abraham had no idea about the death, burial, and resurrection. Yeah, he didn't understand it in details, but guess what? He received it in a figure. He still accepted it, embraced it, like it says. He's persuaded of it. You know, he, he didn't know all of the details, but he still accepted it and received it, as the Bible says, in a figure. Look at verse 20. By faith Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. Now, what is faith? It's things that are not seen. It's the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So did Isaac, of course, had he seen the things to come? Of course not. He wasn't there to witness them and to testify them. But he still blessed him anyways because he believed God when God had, had told him these things prophetically and he still blessed him of things to come. Uh, the same here in verse 21. By faith Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped leaning upon the top of his staff. It's saying that he blessed him of things to come. If you remember, Jacob blessed him of the future. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, things that hadn't happened yet, he had faith that they would happen. He believed in them. Look at verse 22 now. By faith Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. So he believed that the children of Israel would be brought out of Egypt and this is because this was told to Abraham and then Abraham of course passed it down to Joseph and Joseph when he was about to die he made mention how how God is going to visit his people and to bring them out and he believed it even though he wasn't there when it happened he believed the Lord and he believed that he was telling the truth and that God was faithful and his faith in God even though it hadn't happened yet verse 23 by faith Moses, when he was born, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. Now, so that notice there that that's actually talking about the faith of Moses' parents. It's not even talking about the faith of Moses here. And Moses' parents aren't even mentioned that much in the Bible. Does anyone remember the names of both of Moses' parents? They're pretty, you know, you have Amram, that most people can name his father, but his, his mother's name is Jochebed. And she is not mentioned, I think, but once, maybe twice. They're, they're not mentioned very much, but isn't that interesting that they get, they get a mention in Hebrews chapter number 11 in the Hall of Faith, where it's just listing the great men and women of the past that had great faith. And it mentions Moses' parents. That's that shows the importance of, 
you know, uh, having great faith as a parent and setting a great example for your children. Because Moses, who became, of course, a great deliverer and who became a great man of God and did many great, you know, uh, uh, accolades and everything, great achievements. This came about, of course, also from the faith of his parents because they hid him because why? They saw that he was a proper child. And it says, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. So notice how, because of their strong faith, it caused them not even to fear the king's commandment. They weren't even afraid, it says, of the king's commandment. Because they had such great faith, they didn't worry about it and stress about it. And they didn't think, oh, you know, you know uh, if he finds out, he's going to kill us. They weren't afraid because they had great faith. Verse 24. By faith Moses, so notice the chronological order still. His parents, now Moses, we're just moving through the Old Testament chronologically. By faith Moses, when he was come to years, <clears throat> it's saying when he was, he was an adult, right? When he was able to make his own decisions, that's what that means. Refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. So notice that he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's who was raising him and he did not want to be, he did not want to go by that title. He would rather be with the people of God. And if he was going to be with the people of God, he was going to have to suffer affliction with them. He had to make a choice because the Israelites were in bondage at that time. They were being beaten, they were being mistreated and treated horribly. So he, he left Egypt, of course, was the picture of sin and he went and dwelled with the Israelites. Then it says in verse 26, which is extremely interesting, it says, esteeming, that means lifting up, right? Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. Now, what is a reproach? This is a really good verse. Reproach is something bad. Like, it's like the mockery of someone, someone doing something to you, like, like persecution almost, to make it very general and simple, or mockery. It's something that someone looks at and mocks you for. That's what that means. It's talking about him you know, being put into slavery and to bondage and, and you know, becoming a part of those who maybe are looked down upon and, and all the persecution that came with it. And it's saying that he esteemed or thought more highly of the reproach of Christ. He thought that that was of greater value, the reproach of Christ. Greater riches than the treasures in heaven. So notice, it's not only talking about the riches of Christ, it's saying he thought that the reproaches of Christ, or the reproach of Christ being mocked for what? For the cause of Christ was a greater rich, riches, was greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. He would rather have the mockery that comes with Christ then all the treasures that come with Egypt. That's pretty powerful. And notice that it says he esteemed the reproach of Christ. So notice Moses in some sense understood the reproach of Christ, didn't he? He knew about the reproach of Christ. Then it says this, For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So he, re he respected the recompense of the war. What does that mean, the, re the uh, recompense? What does it mean to be recompensed, right? To be repaid for something of the reward. Do you know why he esteemed the reproach of Christ? This is very important to understand because it's, it's again, it's talking about his faith. Do you know why he esteemed, having esteemed the reproaches of Christ, greater riches than the treasures in, which are in Egypt? It's because he knew that for the reproaches of Christ, he would receive a reward in place of that. It says at the end, one more time, think about this. It says, For he had re a respect unto the recompense of the reward. How did he do that? By faith. He had to, by faith, believe that he was going to be rewarded for suffering for Christ. Think about that. So this just, he's talking about the great faith of Moses. So, the reproaches of Christ when you're just living your life and you're going through persecution, you know, so, do you know 100% for a fact that you're going to be rewarded for that? As far as is it seen in front of you? Is someone standing there and holding the riches? Can you look at them? No, you have to do it by faith, don't you? So it's saying that by faith he did these things. By faith he was willing to go ahead and go, go along with and go through with being persecuted and have the reproaches of Christ laid upon him instead of receiving the treasures in Egypt right then and there. Because he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. Because he, had, he was going to be repaid for suffering for Christ. That's the reward. And he was recompensed for 
being reproached for Christ. Now, verse 27, it says this, By faith he forsook Egypt. He left Egypt, didn't he? Not fearing the wrath of the king. So again, notice that faith enables you to not be afraid. Faith enables you to not live in fear in your life. Many times people are fearful and scared about things and worry about things. It's because they lack faith. Even when we stress about stuff, right? Why? Because we lack faith. When people are scared about things, it comes from an, a, a heart where there is faith lacking. Two times it mentions that they weren't afraid because they had faith. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. And then it says this, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now two things I want to point out. Number one, notice it says endured. And what have I kept pointing out also as a theme throughout the book of Hebrews? Have patience. Endure. You know, patience means to endure. That's what all of this is about. It's, it's about them enduring, about having patience, about, you know, striving and pushing through, right? But how did he endure? As seeing him who is invisible. So who did he have his faith in? Well, who does verse 26 say he had his faith in? Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches. So who did he have his faith in? Christ. Then here in verse number 27 it says, For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So who did he have his faith in? Christ. Who did he have his faith in? He who is invisible. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. So this ties in with this teaching that we find in 1 Timothy chapter number 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. <clears throat> Everybody's very familiar with this passage and of course how it breaks down. And uh, I want to look at verse number 14. It says, That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the subject. Which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. This is Jesus, of course. Who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see. And then it says, to whom be honor and power everlasting. Amen. So another powerful passage that is speaking of Jesus Christ as the subject. And it clearly tells you, of course, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. It tells you he's the only person that has immortality. And he's dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. And then it says this about Jesus. Whom no man hath seen nor can see. What is it saying that he is? He's invisible. Saying that Jesus is invisible. Why? Because God is a spirit. The Bible says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now when it's talking about you know, Jesus being the image of the invisible God, of course, Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. It's talking about the body of God. God was manifest in the flesh to where we could see Him in the flesh. But did we actually look at the nature of God? Did we actually look at the being of God? God is a spirit. Did we actually look at the spirit of God? Is that, what, is that what Philip saw in John 14? No. He saw the man Christ Jesus. He saw God's flesh. He saw the body of God. What was inside of that body was the soul of God. What was inside of that body was the spirit of God. It was the invisible God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. But guess what? He also is that invisible God. There's only one God. And Jesus is God. That's why it tells you in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ. That's what he had his faith in. The reproach of Christ. Then at the end of verse 27 it says, For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. So who was he looking to? He was looking to God. Who was he looking to? He was looking to Christ. Because Jesus is the invisible God. He is he whom no man has seen nor can Amen. see. So when you're trusting in God in the Old Testament, do you know where they were trusting in? Christ. Because that is God manifest in the flesh. It's the same person. It's the one true God who is one person who came down and was born in the flesh. So they were trusting in God. They were trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 28. Through faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians assaying to do 
were drowned. The same means attempted or tried. So by faith, they had to have faith to go through the Red Sea there. Verse 30. Notice, we're moving our way chronologically. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Now, the, 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 the literature of the King James Bible is just so beautiful. And it stops right there. And I, you know, the ending portion of Hebrews chapter number 11, it is just, it is just so superb and so excelled in its literature. I mean, it's just amazing. It's, it's one of those passages where it just shows how the Word of God is alive. How it is living and it just proves itself. And you know, one of the evidences of the fact that there are things not seen is the Bible itself. Is the Word of God itself. Because when you read the Bible, it is just filled with power. And it, there's no book. There's no book out there. There are no words of any man that have ever been heard that are on par or as great as the Bible. They're not even close. So it goes through all these great, amazing, exciting stories. And then it says this. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, of David also and Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. There is no piece of literature that's that amazing. Amen. There does not exist a book or, or any writings that are as, as amazing or even close to. They're, they don't even hold a candle to the King James Bible. The Bible is so powerful. It is alive. It just speaks to your soul when you hear it. You know that that power is supernatural. You know that that comes from the breath and the mouth of God. Now when we look at the people that were mentioned there, starting at verse number 32, those are all also in chronological order that are listed. And notice that it ends there with the prophets. That's all in chronological order. Starts with the book of Judges, Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah. They're all in the book of Judges. Then it talks about David and Samuel. They lived concurrently with one another. Samuel just prior to David, but they lived concurrently. And then it says, and of the prophets. So then it just goes on into the future there, chronologically, and the prophets. Then it mentions the prophets. It's talking about the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms. Also, it's speaking of everyone in verse 32. Uh, that whole list... Who, who through faith subdued kingdoms. Of course, David did that. Many men did that. Wrought righteousness, obtained promises. Then it says, stop the mouths of lions. You know, one example of that would be Daniel, who would fall into the category of the uh, uh, prophets. Quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword. There are many examples of all of those. Out of weakness were made strong. Again, many, many examples of those. Waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. When it says flight there, it's talking about people running away. And when it's talking about aliens, you know, it's not talking about UFOs and, and stuff like that. It's talking about uh, foreigners, like foreign, uh, you know, invaders, foreign uh, uh, armies and things like that. They turn to flight the armies of the aliens, of the foreign uh, uh, countries. Women received their dead raised to life again. That happened with Elijah and Elisha. That's two examples of that. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance. Notice that. They, they could have received deliverance, but they went through being tortured and afflicted. They were tortured. I mean, that's a strong word. That's not just persecution and affliction. They were tortured. 
You know, torture. I mean, that's when you are literally restrained and held down by someone and literally the purpose of what they're doing right now is to just inflict as much pain as possible. And I, I want you to notice it says not accepting deliverance. Like they didn't even allow them to deliver them. They wouldn't even allow them to let them go. They did not want to be let go. And what was the reason why? Because their great faith, it says, because they wanted a better resurrection. Now what's interesting, notice how the word better keeps coming up. And you may, I hope that you're more sensitive to these things now that I've pointed it out. But it's saying that the more that they went through, they knew that they would be rewarded for it even more. So they, they're thinking, hey, I'm going to already be resurrected. I'm already going to be rewarded from God. But I'm going to go through even more reproaches for Christ. I'm going to go through even more affliction and more punishment on behalf of God so that I can receive an even better resurrection. So that I can even have a better resurrection and be rewarded even greater is what that means. Because that's why it says that they might obtain a better resurrection. So, and in verse 36, and others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. So one that I think of there specifically is, is uh, Jeremiah. He was put on trial multiple times. You know, he was uh, you know, put in the stocks and, and, and you know, you think about people throwing stuff at him and people just mocking. He was mocked constantly. Jeremiah was mocked more than any of the disciples where it's actually recorded of him being mocked. Uh, and it says, and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonments. I mean, this is the life of all the prophets. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Uh, stoned, uh, referring to the fact they were stoned to death. They were killed. Many of the prophets were stoned to death. It says they were sawn asunder. Sawn is like, comes from the word saw. Asunder comes from the word like to separate, to put into halves. Asunder, sundry. It's saying that they cut them in half. That's what that's saying. So there were some prophets that were actually hacked into pieces or cut in half, sawn asunder, were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Notice the life of a Christian. Notice the life of a prophet, of a man of God of the Old Testament. And why were they willing to go through all of it? Because they, they respected the recompense of the reward. That's the reason why. Because they had such a great faith and they counted Him faithful that promised and they believed that God would reward them for everything that they went through. They had a strong faith in the Lord and they knew God's going to pay me back for all of this. So they were willing to keep going through with it to the point where it actually summarizes their attitude by that they would not accept deliverance. They wouldn't even accept it. Saying they denied it. They were given the opportunities. Hey, just do this. And you think about the prophets of old. Oftentimes, what are they told? Stop preaching in the name of the Lord. Stop preaching in the name of God and you can, you can go. We'll let you go if you promise you'll go out there. You know what they said? Not happening. Not accepting deliverance. Why? Because they knew that God is faithful. They had a strong faith in the Lord and they hoped one day that God would recompense them and pay them back for it. They believed that he would. It says in verse 38, after it talks about, you, you seem like you're, you're reading about, you know, just the, just the like, like Paul talked about how the off -scurring. You think like you're reading about just like the worst scum of the earth. That's what off is, right? Then it says this in verse 38. They look down upon them, and then it says this, of whom the world was not worthy. So these men who were just treated awful, they were looked down upon, they were mocked and made fun of. If you would have actually saw it and just been a random bystander, you would have thought, these people are ridiculous. If you knew nothing about it, you didn't know anything about the Lord, and you saw Jeremiah preaching in the streets, you saw Isaiah walking around the streets being made fun of, saying he's crazy, he's an idiot, no one liked him, no one's his friend, Ezekiel. A lot of them live lives of you know, uh, uh, seclusion. They were rejected by pretty much everybody. And the majority of just a random bystander would say, that guy's an idiot. He's crazy. Look at this guy. Do you know how God views him? It's, I, I love that it's in parentheses. It says, of whom the world was not worthy. They weren't even worthy. All the people around them weren't worthy of Jeremiah. They weren't worthy of Isaiah. 
They weren't worthy of David and of Samuel and of Zechariah who was slain between the altar. They weren't worthy of them. They looked down upon them and thought that they were scum and thought that they were worthless. But actually, in truth, in God's eyes, they, the children of Israel, they, those that persecuted them, weren't worthy. They weren't worthy of the prophets. They weren't worthy of them. And it says, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Remember that time, actually, where it was Obadiah actually uh, took all the prophets and hid them. He hid the prophets. Remember Elijah goes out there at that same time and meets Ahab? Now, where did he hide them? It tells you in, in caves. He was hiding them in dens and in caves. That's a perfect example where the prophets were taken. They hid them. They wandered about in, in uh, deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Does this sound like a, 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 a luxurious life? No, this is the life of the prophets of the Old Testament. This is the life of the great men of faith. The great men of faith. You know, we live in modern America, you know, the United States of America today, and we don't understand what this is like at all. We don't get what this is like at all. Obviously, we don't face the kind of persecution that the prophets of old faced during their time period. But they were literally ran out of cities and pushed out into the desert. They were, they, it, that's why they wandered about. They were hiding. Why was Obadiah hiding them? Why was Elijah on the run? Where he's out literally in a brook. The people weren't worthy of Elijah, but he's out in this brook. Why? Because they're trying to kill him. They're in goat skins and sheep skins. You know, what was the reason why? They were trying to kill them. They were trying to persecute them. That's the life of the prophets. That's the life of the great men of God. You say, I want to be a great man of God. If you wanted to be mentioned in the Hall of Faith, look at the lives that these types of people lived. They were willing to go through with these massive sacrifices. Huge sacrifices in their life. I mean, think about that. You only get one shot at life. One shot at life. You get one life. That's it. When it's over, it's over. And these men said, with my one life, I trust in the Lord so much. I have enough faith. I'm willing to give everything physical away. I'm willing to give away my house. I'm willing to give away my everything. All the way to the point where they, they would rather just wonder about not having a home being persecuted, afflicted, lose their lives, not, you know, uh, accepting deliverance. Then it says this in verse 39. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. Now, if you go back, as I mentioned earlier, Hebrews 11.3, it says, it says or I'm sorry, Hebrews 11.2, For by it the elders obtained a good report. Remember how I said that it's actually summarizing everyone that it's about to talk about as an elder. It's speaking of all those that came before. And that's why you can see that the word elder is a very general word. It's not referring to any of their ages. It's just talking about those of old. Those who came before us. Those that would be like a patriarch. Right? Those that lived before us. They were those that we would look up to. Leaders. Spiritual leaders in the faith. And then it summarizes all of those elders. And it says, And these all having obtained a good report. What did it say? That the elders. By faith the elders obtained a good report. So it's talking about the elders when it says these all. Through faith, it says this, received not the promise. Now, verse 40 is extremely powerful. And I'm going to hit on this real quick, and then we're going to be finished or complete for the evening. So notice that it tells you in verse 39 that all of the amazing things that they did, all of the amazing sacrifices, the things that they were willing to give up, and things they were willing to go through, and how strong their faith actually was. Then it says at the end of verse 39, they received not the promise. Now, have you received the promise? You have. You have received the promise. You know, th those things actually came in our day. They, they were looking toward the cross, but the cross is already finished now. You know, you have received the promise. You received the spirit of promise. We have already received the, the promise has been consummated in that sense, in a spiritual sense. It has been. Then it, and it says this in verse 40, I want you to look at this. God, watch this, having provided some better thing for us. Better than who? Better than them. Why? Because they didn't receive the promise. They didn't receive the promise, but He provided some better thing for us. Meaning what? 
we did receive the promise. They looked forward to the promise. They didn't understand the promise. Then the promise came and was fulfilled. That's what it's saying. So my God went ahead and He physically and He completely fulfilled the promise. As far as our salvation, us going to heaven, all of that is done now. And we received it in the sense that we were here for it. What did it mean before when it said that they hadn't received the promise? It was talking about in their lifetime it hadn't come to pass yet. But has it come to pass now? Yes, it's been completed at Calvary. It said, God having provided some better thing for us. Now I want you to think about this. Who would you expect more faith out of? Those of the Old Testament who had not received the promise or those of the New Testament who had received the promise? The New Testament. So I want you to understand the point that he's trying to make actually at the very end of Hebrews chapter number 11. He gives you this long list of just, again, the amazing things that the prophets of the Old Testament and the men of God of the Old Testament did. And then he ends it with, and these all having obtained a good report. So they obtained a good report, it says, received not the promise. So they obtained a good report through faith. And God was pleased with them through faith. A good report, remember his witness, his testified of them. Through faith, it says, receive not the promise. Saying they didn't even receive the promise. They did all these things and they didn't even receive the promise. And then he says in verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us. God having provided some better thing for us. So what did God do? God provided a better thing for us. Why? Because we did. We had the opportunity to receive the promise. Now number one, what you can take away from this is to be grateful and to be thankful that you live in a time where you receive the promise. Where we can look back at the cross and how much you know, more glorious it is to us than it was to them. They didn't have near as many details. So be thankful to God that you live in a time when you receive the promise. But not only that, the point of this is to tell you and to explain to you that you, having received the promise, should be doing more and have a greater faith than they even had. Look at what it says at the end of verse 40. <clears throat> that they without us should not be made perfect. So notice that they, everything that they did, without us being added to that group, think about that. Without us being added to the group of those people should not be made perfect. What does it mean to be made perfect? Saying that they're lacking something. Saying that it's not complete. Without us being added with them into that same group of all the great men of God that were mentioned, they're not yet made perfect. Do you know what the point is? That now it's your turn to be added to the list. Now it's your turn to be added to the Hall of Faith. That they aren't complete or they're not made perfect. That group is not made perfect without us. Now if they were willing to go through and God gave them a good report for all the things that they went through and they didn't even receive the promise, how much more does God expect from us? We look at, and this is something I want to end on and note, and I want this to resonate with, with, with everyone here. You know, I try to think about this from time to time. We look at the people of the Old Testament like they're untouchables. We look at Moses, and hey, I'm not downplaying all the great things that the men of God of the Old Testament did. That's not what I'm doing at all. But we look at Moses, we look at Elijah, we look at all of these men like, man, they did so much for the Lord, and they did. But we almost lift them up to the point of like where it's not possible for us to live a great life equal unto they did. Now, I'm not saying that God is going to use you to do miracles. I'm not saying that God is going to you know, use you to raise up a, a child from the dead like he did Elijah or to part the Red Sea. But when you stop and think about it in the grand scheme of things, God could use you to do, just as, uh, to do things that are just as valuable as he did Elijah and Moses. He explains to you that, hey, look at all the great things that these people did. Look at all of what they did. And you know how they did it? They did it through their great faith. They did it through the great faith and because of the great faith that they had. And they did it and they had that great of faith even without receiving the promises. And then you know what he does? He mentions you and the fact that you have received the promises. What's the point? Unto whom much is given, of whom is much required. God expects, expects us. We, 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 we have this idea 
that it's like, hey, all the great works are finished. Everything's done. Need I remind you that the tribulation is going to occur on this earth one day. The events of Revelation, not knowing what year, not knowing exactly what time, I can guarantee you that they will happen. The Antichrist will come, and the Bible talks about how the, the Christians that are alive during that time are going to do great exploits. There is going to be a Christian, you know, a, a group of Christians, of, of you know, people that are serving the Lord, that are, that are going to do things that the Bible looks at that are great exploits, that are great works of God. There is going to be a group of people that are going to do things like unto what they did of the Old Testament. Don't look at all of the men of the Old Testament and, and view them and their works and their lives as being a life that you could not lead and not be used just as much. God expects us to do just as much as they did. God expects us, God expects more from us. Why? Because we have received the promise. Because the promise has been fulfilled now and, and we're able to look back at the cross. So you know what that should help you to, to, to do and to have? Greater faith than that of Moses. Greater faith than that of Elijah. Greater faith than that of Abraham and of Noah and of all. We have the full Bible. What do we have our faith in? The Word of God. You know, what, what causes, what strengthens your faith? When you stop and think about it, what do you have access to? Where does your faith come from? Look around at everything. This is the only source. This is the only place where you can derive true faith in the Lord and in Jesus. This is it. The, the, those of the Old Testament didn't have 66 books. They didn't have this Bible. You know, we have such a greater opportunity than they did of the Old Testament. We have the, the better covenant. We have all of the more opportunities than what they had. Hebrews chapter number 11 ends with, God expects more out of us. Not less. And you read that list and you're like, man, you know, how could I attain, obtain unto that, attain unto that? And the Bible, the, what the Bible is teaching here at the end of Hebrews chapter number 11 is that what enabled them to do the great works that they were able to perform was their faith. That's what enabled them to be able to do the great works. And because you have received the promise, you should be able to excel them in faith and therefore do just as much works as they did. Hebrews chapter number 11 is the faith chapter. It's one of the most amazing chapters in the Bible. It is the, one of the major proofs. I mean, all the Bible is amazing, but there are some, you know, uh, uh, just chapters and portions of the Bible that just are amazing. And Hebrews chapter number 11 is an amazing, amazing, amazing uh, chapter. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word, dear Lord. We thank you for Hebrews chapter number 11 and all the great examples of the great men of God. We ask you that you would strengthen us, dear Lord, strengthen our church here. Help us to do great works, dear God, as the prophets did of old. We ask you that you would bless us and, and fill us with your spirit. Help us to walk in the spirit daily and to not you know, fulfill the lusts of the flesh and to mind the things of the flesh, but to grow in righteousness, dear God. Help us to have great faith and to make sacrifices. Uh, to be willing to sacrifice things, things on this world, dear Lord, so that we might uh, receive the recompense. Help us to have recompense. Help, help us to have confidence and to respect the recompense of the reward. We love you, and in Jesus Christ's name, amen.